Hello, everyone. Welcome to Michigan Disability Rights Coalition's Lead and Teams uh, training on uh, how DEI attacks, attacks affect people with disabilities. Please mute themselves. Tamika, can you make me co-host and then I can mute people as they come in? Yeah. Is that better? Yes, okay, please, you can go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. I just muted everyone. Okay, sorry <laughs> about that, everyone. Sorry about that, everyone. Once again, uh, welcome. This is Michigan Disability Rights Coalition's lead and teams training on how DEI attacks affect people with disabilities. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we will have a conversation featuring Tamika Sitchin Spruce and Monica Wiley. All right. Well, uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, joining us today. Really excited to uh, be with this, uh, you know, training for you all today. Uh, we are Michigan Disability Rights Coalition again, um, and uh, this is presented by uh, Lead It, which you'll you know learn uh, more about a little bit later. And this is our uh, workshop on how DEI attacks uh, people with disabilities. Um, and so, you know, we definitely uh, welcome questions. So, uh, you know, feel free to ask questions during, uh, you know, the presentation. Uh, we also uh, will have time uh, to have questions. Well, most of our questions, all of it will be, you know, you'll be able to ask at the end, um, uh, towards the end of the uh, training today. Um, you are, when, it, when we come to that portion, you know, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, or type in the chat. Um, also, uh, feel free to uh, rename yourself, uh, you know, if, if you do, uh, to add your proper pronouns to your name. Uh, this will help the chat moderator uh, be able to, you know, know who you are. Uh, we also have ASL interpreter today and a uh, live captioning uh, that is available. Uh, this is this presentation is being uh, recorded and stream streaming live on our um, Facebook page, uh, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Um, it also will be uploaded to our um, YouTube page as well. And uh, I can, you know, send a little bit of the slides, but really uh, the link to the recording uh, for those who registered. And so what Michigan Disability Race Coalition is, we um, cultivate disability pride and we strengthen the disability movement. Uh, we definitely 100% believe that disability is a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while uh, collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. And so uh, that's really our mission. And uh, to uh, the side of it is the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition and it's, um, it's um, uh, orange background to it, to the words. 
Uh, we also focus on the disability justice infrastructure, so that is our framework. Uh, we also work on any violence, racial equity, increasing tech um, access, cultivate leaders. Uh, we also have done a uh, public health type of uh, work, uh, like COVID resources and the social isolation. Uh, and we provide training resources and services to individuals, families, parents, children, and you know, families in general and organizations as well. Um, so Lead In is a program that I uh, manage um, alongside uh, my colleague Felice. Um, and so we work with um, nonprofit organizations um, right now in the Detroit area. And so we help support them in how to properly and primarily serve BIPOC uh, disabled community uh, to reach their inclusion goals. And so um, it's a cohort style and they learn you know, all various things as relates to disability. And again, how to include those into their programs and um, as and, uh, for employees as well, how to integrate them into their company. Um, we have another program uh, called Lead, and I'll let police uh, talk about that in um, LFI. Okay, so in addition to the lead in program, our leadership program includes the leadership engagement and advocacy development program, uh, otherwise known as LEAD. That program provides BIPOC parents of children um, with IDD as well as adults who identify as having IDD. Um, so uh, developmental um, or uh, invisible um, disabilities with information, tools, and skills they need to develop leadership and advocacy skills uh, to be an advocate for themselves and others. Uh, that program, we have three cohorts a year. The first is specific to adults with IDD who belong to the BIPOC community. The second is a cohort for parents of children with IDD who identify as BIPOC. And the last cohort is specific to the Latinx community whose primary language is Spanish. Um, we do a cohort for that community whose children identify as having IDD. Um, there's also the LFI program, which stands for Leaders for Inclusion. Uh, that program is similar to the LEAD program, uh, only uh, it differs in the fact that it uh, centers around adults 18 to 26 with uh, the tools and the skills they need for leadership and advocacy development. Um, and they also train um, organizations on disability awareness, disability rights, and disability justice, justice uh, through different organizational and institutional systems. Next slide, slide please. So uh, we also have uh, Her Power. Um, it's a really great uh, program. It's an annual camp for young girls with disabilities in Michigan. And this year, we open it up nationally. And so um, it's a fortnight camp, and uh, it happens the end of July, early August of every year. And then we have the Miss Michigan Assistive Technology Program. And so uh, this is to increase ac access to a knowledge of assistive technologies for all of Michigan. And so if you're a person with a disability that needs uh, some type of you know, assistive devices, either for work or school or you know whatever you know that you need it for, um, then you can come to us and we will lend and um, those devices out to you. And um, and so our program is lead leading is uh, funded by the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council. 
So our agenda to, for today is to, you know, define uh, DEI, uh, just briefly talk about the history of DEI, and then we can get to our conversation with uh, the great Monica Wiley, and then we'll get to your questions and comments. So what is DEI? Uh, you know, I believe many of you probably know, you know, what it is, but for those who may not fully uh, know, um, so it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so diversity is really about embracing the different identities um, and perspective a person brings to the table, um, especially when it comes to identities. So that could be, you know, when it comes to age, uh, comes to ability, um, gender, sexual orientation, um, all those things that makes us uh, different as far as our, our identities uh, that is uh, considered diversity. And then you have equity, which is uh, treating everyone fairly and providing equal opportunities. And so uh, we know that sometimes, you know, certain people may have access to certain things. Um, so really it's about making sure everyone has, you know, access to uh, the information and meeting them uh, where they at as well. Um, and then inclusion is about respecting everyone's voice and creating a culture where people from all backgrounds feel encouraged to express their ideas and perspectives. So, you know, making sure that um, the that everyone can fully uh, participate in the workplace or in college, um, you know, so fairly fully inclusion um, included into whatever, you know, is um, happening. So that is uh, inclusion. And just briefly, the history of DEI, because I really wanted to just take out this time to, you know, really lay down the groundwork for our discussion. And so um, there is a great article that was written by CNN and there's, you know, other resources um, that back this up as well. Um, other sources, I mean, that can back this up. But, you know, really you have the civil rights movement and particularly the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that really ushered in you know, as far as, you know, inclusion and not uh, discriminating against people, you know, based on race and, um, you know, other uh, factors. And so, you know, really forced the government to, to do that. Um, and so, and then from the Civil Rights Act that you had uh, the affirmative action, which was, you know, federally uh, mandated, where um, a lot of colleges and um, universities and um, jobs, you know, they needed to, you know, um, bring in more, you know, African Americans and, and other um, identities as well into the workforce and into the conscious because prior to then, you know, they really, you was discriminated against, you were prohibited from, um, you know, as a black person from going to college. And so um, that's where you see um, affirmative action um, taking place. Um, and so uh, from there, then that's when you got into uh, more so the, the DEI and, um, you know, think, uh, companies and thinking of different ways to, you know, bring um, different people um, into uh, the workforce and colleges and such. Um, and so with affirmative action, we do, um, there has been recent um, well, always been backlash similar to DEI uh, so with affirmative action. So uh, they have, they were like recently the last two, um, I think it was in 2022, but I know that they, they, they actually struck um, affirmative action down. So um, when it comes to race, so colleges um, are not able to 
um, do that. I know uh, there was a big um, fight here in Michigan, University of Michigan, back in 2003, uh, which ended uh, from the action for the University of Michigan when it comes to um, race. So uh, from the action is a little bit different from the EI, but um, it's, you know, it's still it's about, you know, how can we make places and colleges and, you know, um, companies um, inclusive, great people of different identities in. Um, and so then we have really with the murder of George Floyd and we, you know, some people call it the racial reckoning. And so that's when you saw um, the I always been around, but you seem like it been more in the forefront publicly uh, where, you know, you have companies that's hiring uh, DEI, you know, officers and chief diversity officers and, you know, different um, jobs and programs and really looking at how can we make these more equitable for, um, you know, particularly Black people, but, you know, all people um, of different identities as well. And so, you know, like I said, you really seen a lot of that um, more in the forefront when it comes to the murder of George Floyd. But of course, you know, things don't last forever. So now you have, um, you know, more pushback. But since then, you have, uh, you know, the EI progress has continued to be a critical issue. Um, that lawmakers and corporate leaders and educational institutions, um, you know, been involved with. Like I said, it's really been at the forefront um, since, you know, 2020. Um, and as we know, there's been uh, a lot of pushback in views of, you know, the high initiatives have seen as unfair and racist, similar to what they've said about um, affirmative action. Um, since uh, 2023, 81 um, anti-DI bills targeting programs in colleges have been introduced in 28 states. Um, I know uh, Florida and uh, Texas is one of them. 67% um, of adults state that their workplaces have offered DEI trainings. 61% uh, states uh, persist stated that workplaces have policies. Um, focusing on hiring, fair hiring practices, and 56% stated their workplaces focus on providing diverse and inclusive work environments. And so, like I said, we've seen a lot of influx and a lot of talks um, about it. But, you know, with that, you know, there has been uh, pushback as well. Um, and so some of that has been you know, disbanding of programs in college campuses and um, in companies um, across the country. Uh, some people have uh, resigned from their jobs, um, feeling, and others have been laid off um, as well. I believe Microsoft was one of the most recent companies that have laid off their DEI um, uh, departments. And, um, and, I, and I've heard personally that some DEI professionals have said that companies, you know, when once they were hired, they give the appearance of commitment, but without actually doing the work and feeling supported, uh, you know, to create the change they want to see. And so that's what led to some of the people um, have been uh, resigned. And so, you know, um, so, you, you know, if you have thought about or if you can think of of um, recent uh, jobs or examples of that, put it in the chat uh, because I know that is something that a lot of us are dealing with. Um, and so um, feel free again to put that examples um, in the chat that you've personally experienced or that you have um, seen other people experience. And so um, that's really what kind of, you know, been, been going on. And that's why it's so important for this conversation uh, today. 
And so, you know, the presenters, uh, so again, my name's uh, Tamika Sitchin Spruce. Uh, my pronouns is she, her, and hers. And again, I'm the lead in uh, director, also a uh, disability justice activist. And uh, so we also have today uh, Monica Wiley. Uh, she is a voter engagement uh, specialist and a DEI practitioner. And I let her you know, introduce herself in one uh, minute. And then we have uh, Felice uh, Turner um, as well. I don't know if you, can, if you want to share a little bit about yourself, Felice. Oh, uh, my name is Felice Turner. I am the disability specialist for the lead-in program as well as the lead program. Um, our pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm just really excited for this conversation today. Yes. So uh, we'll get the conversation started with the great uh, Monica. So Monica, Monica, you know, if you can introduce yourself and share a little bit about of who you are, we we'll get the conversation started. Sure, Tamika. Thank you so much uh, for having me um, and having me speak on this important uh, platform, this important discussion about DEI and the impact of DEI as it relates to people with disabilities, BIPOC women, et cetera. I'm truly delighted to be with you today um, to discuss this. Let me just uh, share or, or give an image description um, of myself. I am a brown skin black woman with lovely long blonde, golden blonde locks that is just flowing to the left side of my face. I felt like I wanted to do it to the left side today, you know, have that kind of look going on um, with some lovely glasses to complement my locks. Um, they are pretty much uh, are like a leopard uh, type of uh, look at the top of my glasses. And then down the bottom of my glasses, it's like a teal green type of uh, color. And so it, it definitely just brings out the blonde look in my locks. And then I have on a lovely, lovely black linen dress um, It has a little bit of some black and white uh, prints on it. And then um, I, one person told me when I presented before, oh, don't forget about your nails, your nails. So let me just show the nails a little bit. Uh, the nails are blue and white with some lovely gold uh, design and then a little bit of bedazzle with some stones on them. So that is what I am looking like today. Um, and as Tamika uh, just said, thank you, Tamika, for the kind introduction. I am a voter engagement specialist, and I also do a lot of training on DEI and disability rights and disability justice. Um, I've been doing uh, this work, wow, for the past, I would say, maybe six years or so, um, even when DEI was not highly spoken about um, until George Floyd, but a lot of us have been working in this area in terms of uh, strategic plans and recruitment and hiring practices, but most importantly for me, DEI and voter engagement and the connection between the two and what we are doing to make sure um, that we are doing everything possible to protect um, the rights and access uh, to voters with disabilities through the DEI lens, which is why our, our votes and, and our uh, ability to be able to cast our vote, that's why it's being attacked. Uh, that is the sole purpose of that. And I don't wanna get too deep into the discussion because Tamika know I can talk and talk and before we know it, we haven't talked or addressed any of the other questions. Um, but that's pretty much the background about me. And again, I'm just truly delighted to be here with you today. And I turn it back over to Tamika. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And, you know, thank you for giving your image description. So um, as far as with my, my I'm, I have a brown skin, I'm African-American brown skin, um, and I have long uh, black hair, and I have a leopard uh, tank top on and a turtleneck, and uh, I have wearing a black sweater, and I am like in my mom's living room. <laughs> the power went out, so got to try to make it work. So uh, that's where you uh, the, the background on the kitchen. And so, uh, yes, yes, yes. And so I'm just going to, if we get started, read some, uh, an example that uh, someone have put in 
the chat, uh, Kareem, that, um, that is very, so very true. I have lots of experience after losing my job during the uh, pandemic, applied for jobs, have a few uh, interviews, experienced a lot of discrimination due to my disability, um, especially revolving around my blindness. Um, I have had much luck with assistance from state services. So I'm looking, trying to look elsewhere. So yeah, that's where we go. You know, that's the title of the the uh, workshop. You know, how does disability, um, you know, is part of the DEI strategy now and how can we, you know, continue to advocate um, for that into uh, the future. Um, another uh, comment is I'm joining from Denmark where a lot of the DEI teams watch the developments care carefully and with worry. The expectation is that the spending of DEI will reach Europe too. And frankly, not many people know what this would entail. Great to be here today and hear your perspective. Yes, we know that, you know, that this is not just many things that happen in one place of the world, you know, expands to different parts of the, you know, world too, you know, as far as with movements. Movements don't have borders, you know, don't have lies or anything like that. So yeah, you definitely have to watch and see how people are moving um, across, not just, you know, within your own country, but around the world as well. So. Uh, thank you for those comments. Um, and so let's get this uh, conversation started. And so just want take a moment um, with you to let's go to um, how has the disability movement, you know, I talked before about the civil rights movement, um, but so like how does the disability movement how, how have it been inclusive to people with different identities, people with disabilities of different identities? Uh, Tamika, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people fail to realize that when they are talking about DEI, they neglect to mention that we are the founding principles of DEI. Uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one is, is when you think about the ADA and even the Rehabilitation Act, when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, especially when it's pertaining to the BIPOC community, we are the founding principles of it because there were civil rights leaders that played an instrumental role in the rights that we have today. Um, and a, a couple of them I just want to mention is the, the passage of the Rehabilitation Act, which we are very aware um, about that prohibits the discrimination um, based on disability programs that come from federal agencies and that are receiving federal financial assistance, right? That was the first, you know, civil rights law for people with disabilities, because I call the ADA and the rehab our civil rights law, because that's what that, that was. When you were, or, or if you are a black woman or black individual, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed before the Rehabilitation Act. There were individuals that were in the civil rights movement that was disabled. So while we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that did not give them protections as a person with a disability until the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And when, and may she rest in power, Judith Hillman, who we call the godmother, mother queen of the disability rights movement, when they decided to take over the, the building in San Francisco, the rehabilitation building in San Francisco and do that sit-in, of course they were there for a, you know, a long time and they needed services, they needed, they needed help, they needed some support, they needed food. Well, 
who helped them to make sure that they were able to maintain their stance on making sure that the rehabilitation building in San Francisco was to comply with the Rehabilitation Act. It was individuals from the civil rights movement. They joined in with Judy Human and several others to make sure that they had the resources that were that they needed to make sure they maintained that sit-in to make a point. It was individuals like Johnny Lacey and Brad Lomax and Chuck Jackson and Bessie Brunt. They were a part of the support as to why the Rehabilitation Act was fully supported in San Francisco when they did not want to do so. So when we, we when we think about you know DEI and when I'm hearing these DNI practitioners talk about DEI, they neglect to mention the disability rights movement and the disability rights movement played a very instrumental role in DEI. That's why I say we are the founding principles of DEI because of that connection um, between the two. And then of course we know then we have the Americans with Disabilities Act and that was to make sure that we were included. I constantly think about my, my favorite hero and shero, Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer slogan, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's what the ADA was about. That was the purpose of the passage of the ADA. We were sick and tired of being sick and tired of not having the fairness, the inclusion that we should have to be able to live a quality productive life. So that is the connection between the DEI, DEI and and uh, and civil rights and disability rights. Those are the connections there. And, and so when we're talking about DEI, we need to make sure, or at least I make sure when I'm sitting on these panels that I come to it from that lens because they need to recognize that DEI, you can't talk about DEI without talking about the disability movement. And the reason why I put the, somewhere the disability movement before anything else, it's because those brave individuals that were civil rights justice leaders and the civil rights movement also took that same support because they know they didn't have the protections as a person with a disability to then make sure that we had those protections and those civil rights protections with the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for that. And so that makes me think about, uh, you know, how can DEI programs, you know, be more intersectional, you know, when it considering the unique experience of people with disabilities who belong to multi marginalized groups. You know, so to to people like us, you know, black women with disabilities or people who have, you know, intersectional identities, um, how can DEI programs be more intersectional in their approach? Well, I, I think in order to make sure that we are creating policies that are intersectional, it's one is we have to look within ourselves. And I, I know what I'm getting ready to say may be uncomfortable but we have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable so that we can move forward as a powerful voting block and group that we are, which is the disability community. I call it the cross disability community because if I can share a little bit of background about myself, and this is germane to your question, I wasn't born with a disability. My disability was caused by a drunk driver that killed my entire family at the age of nine. So I... I come from, in, in a sense, both worlds. I now, I have more of experience as a person with a disability than a person that was non-disabled, but I was, prior to being disabled, I was some bad little child heathen that just did whatever she wanted to do and got on everybody's nerves and had this mindset that I did what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Um, but now that I am in the disability community and I've been in this community for the past, I turned 44 August 1st, that was nine, nine minus 44, I'm not good with math. What was that, 30 some years ago um, since I've been in, in this community. And I recognize even as a person in our community that there are a lot of biases. We have a lot of discrimination and biases in our own community. And so in order for the workplace <laughs> 
to be able to embrace us. And in order for us to make sure that we are developing policies that's inclusive of all of us, we have to recognize some of these assumptions and some of the microaggressions that come with these assumptions. Because DEI is about a collection of, of, uh, of different identities, um, of different experiences, different cultures. So in order for us to be strong as a disability community and supporting one another, we have to embrace the differences, the different disabilities and the different cultures that we come from, right? So eliminating those biases and those assumptions that we have about one another, that will then help and aid in eliminating the biases and discriminations that we see take place in the workplace and on campuses. So a couple of things that we can do uh, or, or that I also recommend that we should be doing in the workplace, in the workforce, one is be willing to embrace or, or first create employee resource groups. Employee resource groups are very effective. They're very effective groups. It's not about, you know, putting um, oh, all black women with disabilities and this group, all white women with disabilities and that group. That's not what ERGs is about. ERGs is about if you are in a group that is black women or black women that are Christians in this group, you are sharing and exchanging valuable information based on your different experiences and then bringing them back to your colleagues, to whomever sits at the table in terms of policies, your HR advisor. Everyone should have a table that is reflective of the different individuals that work in the workplace, that is reflective of, of the college campus. And you bring those together to make sure that you are creating better policy changes. And that's a way of making sure that you have, you know, greater engagement with employees and developing retention. Um, that's also, in too, in terms of college campuses, embracing one another, and then innovation takes place, right? Because innovation is about new ideas. Well, how can you develop new ideas if you don't have a collection of different voices, different ideas, you know, different experiences, different, you know, uh, knowledge that brings, that's what that is about. So we should be supporting ERGs on college campuses and in the workplace. That helps with recruitment and hiring practices. That also expands your, your strategic plan. And then also making sure that you connect with other stakeholders who see that that's what, what, what you're doing over here and they wanna be a part of those efforts. Yeah, yeah. And so if you can expound on that, what are the different iterations of, you know, the I programs that we can, um, you know, advocate for in our workplace or in colleges? Well, one, as I, I mentioned before, um, especially the employee resource groups, I think those are very, very, very um, powerful tools um, and ways that to have some more or, or strengthening the DEI practices um, in the workplace and even on college campuses. Also make sure that you and several others have a seat at the table. If someone doesn't give you a seat, you bring a seat because you know that you have something that is valuable. Now, having said that, I'm sure a couple of people are saying, oh, well then if I do that, I don't wanna get fired. That's not what I mean by, you know, if no one invites you to the, to the meeting, you, you bring a seat. What I mean by when I say bring a seat, I am saying to you that bring your seat, meaning you are constantly in these individuals' ears. You're constantly letting them know, you know, that this is, that I should be here and here is why. This is taking place out here from a grassroots perspective. Here is why this can be very effective in the workplace. So when someone doesn't give you a seat, you bring your seat, meaning you make sure that you are constantly letting them know that you are a person that has a level of expertise and voice that can be very effective to them. Even sometimes be willing to even draft up maybe a little report that shows that, you know, this is what we could be doing. This is what I have been seeing or experiencing in other groups outside of the workplace that I am connected to, that we these types of um, these types of activities and programs, I'm seeing how this has been very effective in my community. This is something that we can bring into the workplace or even in the college campuses, but we can do them a little differently. If you have a policy background, let's say you've only been doing policy for a year, that's fine. 
you have a level of experience, make sure that your experience is being shown and that you're showing that experience. Sometimes, yes, I, I and what I'm about to say, um, I know some of you may say, oh, but we have to, uh, you know, always overperform or, you know, over deliver all the time because we have our disabilities. I get that. I, I get that. And, and you are correct. But make, let me be clear about this. There's always one person. There's one person that is always paying attention to what you're doing, to your outperformance, over delivering, you know, over providing, going over, over, you know, over extending themselves. And you never know what conversations are being had or being talked about in the background that says, you know what? Um, I think we should really, you know, pay attention to a couple of these individuals or Tamika or Felice or Monica or Tanya or John or Jack. You know, granted, yes, um, we may not uh, necessarily have um, enough space in our strategic plan for these individuals, but maybe we need to sit back and, and get with the, you know, with our strategic planning uh, people and let's restructure this so that they, we can have more of some buy-in from these individuals because they do incredible work. They are great speakers. They provide, you know, great, great data. They are very well connected with other communities and other stakeholders that we can benefit from. So again, these are the types of things that we can do um, to make sure that we are having various iterations that can be implemented um, in the workplace and in, in college campuses. Yeah, yeah, and that just makes me think about you know, as far far as um, you know, the the case for you know the I the, the case for including people with disabilities, you know, and why the I and you know including disabilities is so important because you know we bring diverse you know, perspectives and diverse, you know, identities. And then you have an entry point as far as into a new market that, you know, is totally untapped, you know, because uh, I know disability, you know, we as a as a community, I think it was like, what, like a billion or so, you know, as far as with money and things like that. And so, you know, there is definitely a case uh, that can be made, you know, business-wise, community-wise, those who uh, the studies have shown that with the best workplaces are people who feel comfortable, who feel like they belong, and, you know, and they do better work. So, I mean, it's just a win-win all the way, a way around. So, you know, it's like we, we need to continue to advocate for that. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with being assertive. There's nothing wrong with uh, being assertive. The, yes, you have, you know, bosses with different personalities and, and different approaches to, to getting things accomplished, even in your HR department. But at the end of the day, everyone likes someone that's assertive. You want to know why? Because it lets them know that you are committed, that you really believe in and what needs to take place and you are committed and that passion exudes from your assertiveness. So hold leadership accountable, be assertive. There's nothing wrong with being assertive. Now, of course, I'm not gonna say to you, you know, go to your boss and be like, how dare you? You're not doing this, you're not listening to me. We know they're not listening. We know they're not listening. That's why we keep coming to them all the time. But again, they don't make the space. You create the space. You show your assertiveness, you show your abilities, you hold them accountable. They, they will ultimately embrace that. And that is how you can have various quality, good iterations of DEI, you know, with your inclusion diversity trainings, with your ERG groups, um, with constantly looking at your strategic plan. I know strategic plans are, um, some are short within one year um, based on the, the different, uh, different areas of your strategic plan and some are three to five years, but strategic plans can always be revamped. There's ways to create policies, just like a president can have an executive order. There's always ways to create a policy to add to the strategic plan to create that space. So they don't give you the space. They don't give you a seat. You bring a seat. Exactly, exactly. And I see here in the chat, uh, we have great conversation and people are sharing uh, different ways of, of DEI uh, programs and ways that could be done. So uh, one person said, 
Uh, Matrice said training for education. Uh, Shanice said lunch and learns. Uh, office hours are effective as well. Um, and another thing, I like what uh, Matrice, uh, no, I'm sorry, Paul, that was Paul that said, um, uh, really big, great comment that uh, that sometimes the big bosses and CEOs are really uh, busy. So sometimes it's best to go to the middle management, C-suites, mm -hmm. uh, one step lower mm -hmm. because they have more power and influence to get, that can help get the ball rolling. And so, yeah, thank you, Paul, uh, for that. That's really uh, great advice. Oh, I that, is, that is absolutely good advice. And I like the lunch and learns. Another good one too is diversity celebrations, which brings me to, I, I don't know if you have a question pertaining to this, Tamika, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and say yes, yes. Uh, this piece. When we are, we're constantly seeing the attack on DEI and eliminating DEI offices and chief diversity officers. And they, they're saying that they, they don't find it effective or beneficial well then there's still a way to implement DEI without them necessarily having, because they have an issue with, the, with the, the, the slogan or the statement DEI, right? So then, oh, no problem. So then we can come to it from this, uh, well, it is a problem, but we can come to it from a, a different angle. You can do diversity celebrations, Women Equality Day. Uh, um, what, what is it? A ADA celebration days. Um, um, you know, Black women payday, Latino payday. Again, those are all components of, of DEI and making sure that we recognize these individuals and these various groups and communities that have made an impact and continue to make an impact in the workplace, on college campuses, in our communities, in corporate America, and nonprofit, et cetera. So whoever said the lunch and learn, I absolutely agree with that. I, I was gonna uh, mention that, but I got on my soapbox. So thank you for that. But diversity celebrations is another one as well. Yes, yes. So let's take a minute, um, just before I get to that, I know um, on Eventbrite said one o'clock, but we're actually going to um, extend it to the conversation to uh, 1.30. And so um, just wanna make that, uh, that note. Um, as well. And so, um, and then also we're going to be putting an evaluation um, in the chat. And so uh, just to let us know how you like, you know, the conversation and ways we can um, improve um, the training as well. So just want to make that note. Uh, so let's shift gears uh, just for a minute, uh, Monica. I know, uh, like I said, uh, a little bit before, there's been a lot of pushback on uh, DEI. In fact, uh, Elon Musk, <laughs> and to put him in this space, but Elon Musk, uh, you know, a great example of that, he was saying about uh, with, he's really against DEI programs, and he gave, uh, said something <laughs> to the fact when um, the Boeing airplanes and you know, they, you know, some of them were malfunctioning and he was like, well, you know, they malfunctioning, you know, because of DEI and, you know, and if I see, you know, a black person on the plane, you know, the pilot, you know, I'm going to be questioning it. It's just really nasty things, you know, about DEI and Elon Musk is now alone. There's a lot of you know, other people that feel that, that way too, that the I equates to people are not qualified or, you know, or they are, um, you know, not up to par and things like that. And so why do you think that is, you know, is so hated and being attacked? Um, you know, some of the examples uh, uh, that we see. And just one that I can think of that really made me angry is how, um, what was it, the Fearless Fund, uh, which, you know, it's a little bit different, you know, than DEI, but it's similar to the fact that 
you know, helping black women own businesses and they being sued and going to the Supreme Court, the, the court case, and they're using things that uh, from the Civil Rights Act, you know, against us and things like that. So, you know, why do you think that, you know, the core reasons the EI is being attacked and what would be the alternatives which would you share a little bit before? Thank you for the question, Tamika. And I will try to make sure that I don't include too much of my personal um, take on why DEI is being attacked. Well, I, let me say this part. I am going to say this. I think for individuals like Mr. Elon Musk and several others that share that, that thought process, and, and my personal feeling, and then I'll get to uh, it from, uh, from a more knowledge-based uh, perspective. And my personal, uh, uh, my personal feeling is that they feel that power is being taken away from them, that they are the only ones that uh, should be able to have these different ideas, run and control, um, a certain sector, industry, and that everyone should bow down to them. They, they don't want to redistribute. I don't even want to say necessarily redistribute the wealth. I want to say redistribute the opportunity to have an impact and to be able to be as innovative as they are. So it, it's, a, it's a fear. And coming to it from... Um, from my my heritage as a black woman that is what took place in the black community fear was always always put in front of them especially when our ancestors were slaves this is what we are seeing now now going to it from a knowledge perspective it is the the whole aspect of fear um fear of not being looked at as the great Elon Musk that I was able to create this and be this you know, innovative and I am the only one that's able uh, to do this. I also think too, uh, and that's how I was gonna get to the knowledge base piece, but I, I apologize. I'll get to that in just a second. I also think that there is a lot of sexism um, associated with this, that going back to disability justice and identity, that only a certain person or certain gender, I, 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 you know, if you will, or certain identity are the only ones that should be able to be in certain positions or positions of power. And anything that does not look like that, they're gonna constantly attack it. Um, they tend to use, now from a knowledge base, they tend to attack DEI because they related so closely to affirmative action. Exactly. And they feel like that it pushes them in the back of the line um, and that it strips away opportunities for them to take advantage of. Again, they don't want to redistribute the opportunities for others to be able to to do great things like Elon Musk, you know, and I, you know, aside from the fact that I, I don't like him um, as a individual because of his position and stance on DEI, I do like the level of brilliance he has, though, in terms of what he has been able to do. You know, the Tesla vehicles are simply phenomenal. Now, me personally, I'm not going to get one for the sole purpose of I'm not willing to make that type of car payment monthly and pay $3,000 for maintenance on, on something electrical when I could be having that money to go on a trip. That's just me, <laughs> okay? So I'm gonna go with something that's a little bit more hybrid, something that's a little bit more cost-effective, and I can still go to Tahiti with my girlfriends if I want to, instead of watching them from the window as they take off on a plane, because I have a Tesla. However, uh, he has done some and, and several others that, that adopt that same mentality. I, I appreciate their brilliance. I don't like, I don't care too much for them as an individual because these are the individuals that harm 
humanity. If we're going to talk about us being united, you know, this is supposed to be the United States, right? So we can't be united if we have this type of divisive policies and this type of divisive mentality from individuals um, coming, you know, coming from them. And, and, I, and again, as I like to say, we have more in common than we have of differences. So why can't we look at just us being a part of humanity and embracing the commonalities that we share and build on, on that, you know, build solely on that. So uh, I, I think that from a knowledge perspective too, it's being attacked also because there is money associated with it. There's, a, there's that financial component, right? And if, again, if they feel like that the money is pulling away from a certain group that has always been able to take advantage and leverage certain opportunities. And now those opportunities are not necessarily being taken away from them. It's just providing more doors and windows of opportunities for others to, to be able to um, capitalize on and, and do some great things and stuff for those uh, of us that, that do take advantage of those because of the DEI practices and initiatives we are looking at ways of how we can build others, build others up, build other communities up, build up our community, the disability community. We're not looking at solely for just, just me, me, I, I only. It is it, when windows of opportunities, doors of opportunities are being extended to me because of the DEI plans, because of the inclusivity and the fairness, I'm also bringing along my tribe of folks from the cross disability community with me. Because I can't do it alone. It, 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 if it affects one, it affects all. And yeah. so um, those that are attacking DEI, they're not looking at it from the perspective of a fair. Well, I guess they are because they, they don't want it to be fair. They don't want it to be inclusive. They don't want, it, uh, they don't want access for everyone, only access for a certain a certain demographic, um, a certain community. And so that is that is what we're seeing. And if you go back and look at some of the news um, clippings or you know some of the interviews that they have done, if you read in between the lines, of course, that some well, Elon's gonna flat flat out say, listen, to a certain degree, I'm prejudiced. Now, I don't, again, I don't like that, but I at least can respect the fact that he's being transparent about, listen, I don't care too much for this particular group. Others, they hide behind it with certain words and certain actions that they that they take that can be, you know, a bit subliminal, right? So when you listen to them, you can obviously hear that that what they basically are saying is, is that there's no need for, you know, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and figure it out. We all know that pulling yourself up by your bootstraps does not work. These types of these types of narratives and thought processes, these are called dominant narratives. And I can go kind of deep with that and we don't really have time for it too much, but these are the dominant narratives that are taking place. And that's why it's being attacked because they have these dominant narratives. Oh, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, work hard enough, you'll get there. But then as I love to quote by our former first lady, Michelle Obama, we get to that bar, it keeps shifting and moving because of these types of practices. And so we need DEI. We're gonna talk about being a united country, a United States of America that is founded on diversity, founded on being inclusive of everyone. Then let's make sure that we have these practices in place because there's individuals out here that wanna do the total opposite. Exactly. And that's that's definitely what I agree with you. You know, it's like it's not that we want handouts or whatever, whatever. It's that we want the same opportunities. We want to, you know, we want to, you know, have the opportunity to succeed like everyone else. And so it's about inclusion. And like we said before, it benefits everyone if everyone is included. So it's a no brainer, uh, but I do see a really great uh, question uh, from Jack and uh, uh, mention a comment from Paul as well. Is that, um, let's see, I just was there. Um, so Starbucks, like for the, the founder of the executive of, of Starbucks, he's, you know, been against the high and, you know, other 
people. And so it's a two part question. The you know the first part, what do we say is a as far as with a counter act, you know, counter argument. You know, when people make these type of comments, what should we say? And then the other question is as far as with if they, you know, we continue the path of disbanding, you know, DI programs, you know, what about uh, accessibility? You know, would that, how do we prevent that from being disbanded as well, because we know that affects a lot of people with disabilities. I think, I'm sorry, who was the uh, the person that asked the question? I want to make sure I address them accurately. What was yeah. the name of that individual? Yeah, so Paul was the one that asked about the accessibility, and, um, and then Jack was the one that asked about uh, the counter argument. Okay. Uh, Paul and Jack, thank you both for your questions. Paul, I'm going to address your, your question first, because I love the, the question, <laughs> excuse me, about the accessibility component. And the reason why I, I like to talk about the accessibility piece is because individuals, groups, even the workforce, when they hear the word accessibility, they automatically connected to our community, which is fine, but from a negative stigma place. And when I talk about accessibility, I make sure that, yes, I am a person with a disability who requires some accessibility, but doesn't everybody? Accessibility, access is the derivative of acceptability. So if no one has access, no one has acceptability. And so in order for us to have access, in order for anybody to have access to anything that they're trying to, trying to do or trying to accomplish, you need oh. those accessibility measures. You need to request access. Um, and the same thing as accommodations. They automatically make it such a negative stigma about accommodations to people with disabilities. Oh, that person requesting accommodation, they must have, you know, disabilities or several disabilities. She? E everyone needs to be accommodated. I'll give you a classic example. If we're all at a restaurant and, and there's a, a particular dish that we like and that we were interested in, but there may be a ingredient in there that we can't have, but you know, we th this dish is something we really, really want. We would then ask the waiter or waitress and say, hi, I really want this particular dish, um, but I'm allergic to the nuts. Is there any possible way that this food could be made without the nuts? And sometimes the response is, or a lot of times the response is, yes, we can do that, no problem. That's an accommodation. Now, I'm not trying to water down accommodation. I know that accommodations for us it, it, as people with individuals based on our, our disability that we need um, additional accommodations or the accommodations may be um, a little bit more, um, require a little bit more detail and a little bit more of support. But basically what I am trying to say is, is that when it comes to accessibility, we have to also make sure that we connect it to, uh, well, we, they already connect to our community, but make sure we're connecting outside of our community so they can see and say, aha, you're right. If there is a mother with a child in a stroller and she's trying to get to the building and there's no curb cut, she may not be disabled, but she now does not have access. So we need to make sure that we make sure that people recognize that yes, as a community, yes, we do need accessibility because we have been denied inclusivity and fairness for a long time, but then also make sure you, you make sure it's relatable to a person that's not disabled. That's how you are able to make differences and impacts and changes and, and policies for the betterment of us as people with disabilities and as humanity as a whole. So I, I hope that answered your question, Paul. Yeah, he said too, it was more so a statement. They say like the, the they want to try to save it because they know it's important to us. But the issue is that if DI gets disbanded, accessibility will be thrown in the trash and we can't have that. So yeah, we do that. That's definitely, you know, true. So it's more so a statement, but accessibility. Okay. Okay. It just it just one like one minute um as far as with Jack, like what are some more uh 
counter arguments that we can have with people say, oh, we don't need it, you know, DEI, get rid of it. So like, you know, what what is one uh, counter argument we could give? Well, you know what I would say to that? If they say we don't need it, but then you don't need half of humanity. So then you, you, you don't need me. You, you don't, you know, you, you don't value me. You don't value others. And to be honest with you, if all of us was to come together, um, the diverse communities that we, we are and our, and our diverse cultures, if we stop supporting these individuals, because they are only being connected to individuals that have that same type of thought process as them, the same type of discriminatory thoughts and, and practices that they do, after a while, they're going to get tired of each other because they, they all think the same. They're all operating the same. So they need us. They need us. If we recognize our power individually and collectively, that will make some changes. That would also make them say, okay, you know, maybe we should, or there's no maybe, we do need to have these practices in place. So I would be quick to say, but then you, you don't need me and you don't need half of, of humanity out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes. start off, how will you continue to run? How will you continue to function and be operational? Because there's other great coffee places that are <laughs> ran and owned and operated probably by a person with a disability, right in your community, right in your state. Oh, I'll just get it ordered and delivered. I don't need Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So nothing for us without us. So you don't, you don't have, you don't, <laughs> you, you can't, you, you don't want to embrace me. You don't want to embrace the eye practices, you, but then you, you don't need me. You don't need me. You don't need half of humanity. And on that note, I will go ahead on and redistribute my money, my hard earned, earned money, whether I get it from working or whether I get it from Social Security. Either way, it's still mine. And so what I'll do is I'll just pull my money out of there. Money talks. Money talks. And then your actions talk. And trust me, they will then begin to see, okay, let us start working with them and embracing, you know, some DEI. They may not embrace the full DEI. Like I said, DEI, it, can, it has various, you know, levels and, and, and can go very, um, can be very complex and very, very detailed. But trust me, if you start shifting your, your support of these individuals with your money, with your with your pocket, even if you are giving them traction on social media, stop. That will get their attention. Stop. That's what I say to you. Just just say okay, no no problem, and trust me, it will it will then <laughs> they will then begin to see just how deep it is hurting them as a business as a businesswoman, a person, and as a individual that's trying to expand. Because at the end of the day, these individuals, all they look at is looking at it from a corporate standpoint and, and, and protecting their folks. And so when they don't have us to be able to do that, it impacts them. So then they say, okay, let, let, let's come back and let's, let's come back to the table. Let's come back to the, the decision-making table. Let's talk about this more. Let, let me get an understanding of, and then at that point, I would be open and willing to sit down at the table. And my question would be, what, what is it that is, I don't, you don't want to use the word intimidation, but that's what it is to a certain extent. You, I would want to say to them, what is it about me or about my community that you, you're struggling with, that you seem to not want to support? How can we help you support us and vice versa? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That and that and that makes me, you know, think about uh, you know, there's things that we personally can do, um, as you shared, um, you know, to to counteract this, you know, disbanding in and, and, and ways that people are um, are attacking uh DEI. So Let's look for a minute. I know we have um, about you know twelve minutes left, and so um, let's just shift it to voter engagement. So you know when it comes to voting, so how can what kind of legislative policies would help support inclusive 
environments in the workplace in college campuses. Well, Tamika, I don't know if you can see my face, but you know, I have the biggest grin because this is right up my alley, right yeah. here, right, 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 right here. I love this. Yeah. So thank you uh, for, for the question with that. Uh, so a, a, a couple of things. Uh, one is I'm going to share just, you know, briefly, hopefully I can be brief, we'll see, um, about what I have tried to do in terms of policy and in terms of law to make, uh, make DEI um, more um, effective in voting and as a voter with uh, a disability. When I was in Virginia, <clears throat> I noticed that there was no curbside voting for people with disabilities. Now, I recognize that everyone does not uh, have a vehicle. They do, they do not drive. But how I see it, if you use a scooter, if you use a wheelchair, that is your form of transportation to a certain extent. You're, they're, they're your legs. They're, they're, they, you, you use those. That To me, that is your, your transportation. And there was always long lines. There was never any type of mechanism or apparatus that would make it a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more convenient for voters with disabilities. Now, I am a driver. I, I do drive. And having said that, I walk with a cane for short distance walking, long distance walking, I have a travel scooter. And when I would go to go and vote, I would have to wait in these long lines. And then it got to the point where my uh, precinct, they, they would know me, we would develop a relationship that when they see me, they would bring a chair uh, for me to sit down or they would have an election official stand in my place while I go sit to the side. And then when it's time for me to go and vote, then I can get up and go and vote. Here was my issue with that. Just like everyone else is able to stand in line and be able to wait in line and wait in line comfortably, I should be able to do that as well. It should not be a burden or it shouldn't be um, putting my, my body physically and mentally in distress. So, I decided to have Virginia, which Virginia at that time was a very conservative state. It was almost as if you had to sell two legs, three body parts and everything to get something accomplished. Um, I said to them, I said, listen, there should be curbside voting for people with disabilities. Everybody doesn't want to vote by mail. As a person, again, as a black woman coming from a, a lineage and, and heritage and ancestors that's fought not only for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but they still didn't have any voting rights until 1965. So coming from that background, I don't want to vote absentee. I want to vote with my peers like everyone else. And so I said to Virginia, I said, we need to have curbside voting for individuals with disabilities so that when they come, they should be able to get signage, they should be able to pull up, in Virginia, you had to show an ID. Now, I know in other states, there, there's variations. You don't have to show no form of ID. You just give your name. But in Virginia, they need to see an ID so they can know that you are registered to vote. So you pull up, you show your ID. They bring out the ballot. It is protected and sealed. It goes back in. They run it through, and then you get your, your sticker. It went from, they, they approved that. It went from being curbside voting only doing the general election to curbside voting, even during the primary. And so I was one of the individuals that was the architect in getting Virginia to adopt curbside voting for the primary and for the general election. Shifting. I'm in Maryland now. Maryland giving me a little bit of a hard time, but they don't know how much of a pit bull in a skirt I am. So we, we, we're going to get, you know, we're going to go ahead and get that done in Maryland. Trust me, in 2025, we came this close in 2024. We will get it done in 2025. I say all that to say that what we can do as individuals with disabilities to make sure that we have greater access and making sure that we are doing voter outreach and engagement to our communities are, is get with a group of people that not only have a disability, but also don't have a disability. They don't have a disability, but you have a shared commonality because maybe you all like 
you know, trivia week. And so, you know, you, you're both in trivia and you say to them, hey, you know what, you know, access to the to the ballot, it's, it's, it's difficult for me, it's difficult for my community and I'm sick of it. And I, I want some partners to help me um, create this law to help me make an impact. Who do you know or who can you connect me with that we can begin this conversation and begin this, this process so that we can have these laws in place that's going to be for the betterment of us. Now, we know that the HAVA Act, Help Americans Vote Act, does have um, where uh, per precinct, you, uh, you need to have at least one voting machine that's accessible, but that's one voting machine. But secondly, how do I get in there? If I'm too tired, if I'm too exhausted, if my legs and stuff are swollen, whether I'm in a wheelchair, whether I'm in a stroller, whether I'm in a scooter, whether or not, when we are in line waiting, it is a burden on our bodies. It, it does a lot to us physically. We should not have to go through that because of our disabilities. Just like everyone else should be able to have full access and it shouldn't be a problem, it should be the same thing for us. So make sure that you connect with people that are disabled, but then also that are not disabled. Make sure you establish relationships with those individuals that are connected to elected officials on the local level. Establish relationships with, with partners and with community organizations that are connected to these elected officials. You know, develop a task force, a, you know, a team, a group of people, again, that it should be disabled and non-disabled that can elevate your voice. That is how you do that. And most importantly, when we're talking about voter engagement and voter outreach and when we're doing that in, in terms of the work that we're doing to make sure that our folks, people with disabilities, are able to vote in this election, I believe it's 40 Point two or four, let's just go with 40, 40 million out of 70 million people with individuals, 40 million are eligible to vote. We should be making sure that we are doing everything we can in terms of using an engagement tool to make sure that we are, um, we are connecting with our people and that they have access to the voting ballot. And what I call an engagement tool or the engagement tool I think we could definitely use in terms of this, it's called to, it's, it's called Listen, Learn, and Engage, L-L-E. Learn, listen, and engage. And when we learn from other, one another, solutions are established. And we're able to make sure that we're making impact and we're learning from each other's from historical backgrounds. And we're able to access some data and use current systems that are affecting us so that we can make these system changes. Because that's what it's about, right? It's about systems change. So we, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing that. Then we also have to make sure that we're listening, you know, listening about, we talked about policies, right? How can we make these changes with policies? We need to know what the current policies and laws are and these practices that are affecting our community. You know, that is how we are able to do more voter outreach, make policy changes, create laws, you know, how these systems are used to marginalize us and disenfranchise us. When we know the laws and policies, can't nobody tell us nothing. Exactly. Because we know them. Yes, yes. And we unfortunately we have three more minutes. So what would be your recommendation as far as like five years from now? You said listen and learning and talking Engage. and learning policy. So what would you say overall? What can we as the high practitioners, as disabled advocates, you know, or both, you know, that hold both titles, what can we do 10 years from now? to continue inclusion in the workplace or DEI in the workplace? Show up, show up, be willing to show up. Show up in spaces and places that typically don't have disability representation. Show up, be bold, be fearless, listen, make sure you listen to one another, learn from one another, engage from one another and, and be involved in, in the policy make. Again, if no one gives you a seat, you bring a seat. If let's say for instance, oh, well, you know, I'm not really able to, to leave home or, you know, I'm not really able to attend these events. A lot of these events now are virtually. Show up in the virtual spaces. If you can, show up in person, show up in both spaces. Make sure you are relevant. Constantly being in these individuals' ears. Establish these relationships and make sure that you are continuing to listen and learn and engage from one another. That is how we make impact and that is how we continue to build out DEI in the workforce, in the community, in corporate America, and even in our own community in the disability community. 
Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I put a survey uh, in the chat. So please uh, fill that out. And Monica, where can people uh, find you? Um, they, <laughs> of course they can find me on um, LinkedIn. Um, I can give my LinkedIn information. I don't know if you have it, Tamika. Um, and they can definitely feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, you know, definitely email, um, definitely LinkedIn. Um, Yes. Love to, you know, to talk, love to interact, love to connect, love to build, love to, to do what we need to do for us, okay, for us. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you, everyone, for joining uh, the conversation uh, today uh, here at FDRC and our other leadership programs in um, our AT with the monthly training of such as that. And so uh, please follow um, us at uh, Mr. Bitfield Rice Coalition on Facebook and LinkedIn to get um, the rest to upcoming uh, training. So thank you again. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here with all of you. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for your questions. Thank you to our ASL interpreter and our car services. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. We're done streaming. Tamika, do you